For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Hello. Hello, my name is Christina Maxwell, and um, with the help of Andrew Maxwell and Adam Maxwell, my two sons, who are 13 and 10 right now, um, I'm able to do this little video, and um, I thank God for them, and I just wanted to share this with whoever um, needs to know that there is a hell, and there is a heaven, and there is a God, and um, I really need to put this out there. It's been on my heart for a while and so for years but um, I've been in the process of writing a book not only about this but other miracles that God has done in my life and um, here we go. Well um, I need to share with you that uh, in 2008 um, I was rushed to the hospital and um, by my husband because of severe stomach pains and um, I didn't know what was going on and felt like I was pushing out a baby and um, it turned out they did uh, I wasn't pregnant thank God um, because the pain was so severe and anyway uh, let's see they um, admitted me they did tests and um, they um, gave me morphine okay and um, for the pain and um, they were it turned out that I had irritable bowel syndrome um, but in the process of figuring this out um, they gave me this morphine drip and um, it was horrible I didn't know I was allergic to it they didn't know I was allergic to it and so um, I immediately stopped breathing and I told them anyway the nurse had to rush press a, a button and it notified the staff that uh, there I was there was a problem and so um, I stopped breathing and I was crying tears were coming out my eyes and um, I can just remember thinking I don't want to die and the nurse um, the other uh, bunch of nurses came in and the nurse was saying breathe breathe and I couldn't breathe and so I stopped breathing and I immediately darkness just came upon I just remember blacking out and my body I left my body and I went immediately into this um, other place I left and was taken I felt like I was just really light I was taken to another place and um, I was in a holding cell and this holding cell I could hear all these screams and um, I could see uh, these big demons um, horrific figures um, one big one in the middle of this ca cave like place and there was like fire in the back I, I it wasn't like fire it was like lava kind of and so anyway um, he was telling all the other demons where to go and sending them out and they were coming in with people people were just coming into this place and I remember saying, you know, um, Allah, you know, help me. And um, Jesus, in my mind, I couldn't speak, though. And it was so hot, and the screams were so loud, and these creatures all over the place, these demons all over the place, um, crawling on the ceilings. And there was just people coming in, though. That was just horrific. But the minute when I, uh, right away when I said Jesus, then I started leaving out. I, I left out this portal type um, area, this opening in the cave, and I came out through a place that looked like um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Street, and I came flying out um, my my body. Uh, I've entered my body, and I um, just started saying, "I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back." What happened is before that, I would um, still I was. Um, I used to be a Muslim and um, I was seeking God I would 
I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist when I was a teenager, and as I went in my 20s, I met a woman who was very kind and took me under her wing, and she was my neighbor, and she was a Muslim. And so I studied with her, and she would call me her daughter, and she was a voodoo priestess as well. She was Muslim and had voodoo things, and her background was um, uh, just, oh. Anyway, um, but so she took me under her wing, and, and um, she was teaching me these things and teaching me to pray to Allah. And so I thought, oh, it has some of the, the, the Quran has the Old Testament in it, and so Allah must be God's name. And so anyway, I ended up leaving the Muslim um, practice, and um, I was seeking God and would go to Christian churches. And so, um, but the thing is, is I was all mixed up, and I would pray to Allah instead of uh, Father God, Jehovah. And I, I would... Um, I would say amen, but I wouldn't. I wasn't taught to say in Jesus' name, amen. So anyway, but when I said the name Jesus in hell, it, it's what saved me. You know, it's what brought me out. I know he would, he he pulled me out of there. And so anyway, what I when I came back, there was these doctors working on me, and there were nurses in there, and they kept a nurse in my room all that night until the next day. And then another nurse came in and stayed with me in the room because they wanted to get the morphine. They had to um, uh, flush my body, and they wanted to make sure I wouldn't die. You know, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna go anywhere. And so um, she was scared, and the doctor um, said that was a close call, and you were gone there. Um, and the thing is, I'm not quite sure how long I was gone, but I just remember I, I didn't care <laughs> at the time. I just was. Um, uh, grateful to be alive and to come back and he says uh, anyway and and I just remember him saying you know assigning the nurses to me and um, them staying with me uh, so around the clock so anyway it was a if, if anyone is um, wondering if there's many more ways to God than um, through then just through Jesus it's not true Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life and he's the only way to the Father, is through the Son. And I had to go through this and experience this. And um, some people may say, oh, you were on a morphine trip. No, I stopped breathing. I, my, I just, I went into complete darkness and I was gone. And um, they were, the doctor even said, you were, you were gone. And we're, you were not with us for a little while, and we're glad you're back. And um, I believe me, I'm glad I'm back. And that um, through Jesus is real, and um, He's the only way. So thank you for listening. And believe me, you don't want to be caught dead without Jesus. And anyone who does not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, any church that does not believe in the power you need to run from them um, run and find believers who believe in Jesus Christ and those who um, have power love and a sound mind and through Jesus Christ I have a sound mind and I have been healed from many things and um, I've been delivered and set free and I just wanted to share this thank you my name is Christina Maxwell and I am blessed God bless you all Hell is definitely real. It's real. Very much real. Carl Knighton knows what hell is like because he says he went there after he accidentally overdosed on a drug called Valium. Like the Bible says, you in torment. Even though it happened more than 20 years ago, Carl was able to draw pictures of what he says he encountered in hell. The one in the middle, they, they trying to get out, out of, uh, out of the fire, but it, it's the not there's no way they can get out. There's no hope for them. Uh, there's no way of escape for them. Carl grew up in a Christian home where he had been taught that heaven and hell were real places. Even as a child, he was sensitive to the things of God. I always felt the presence of God. I've seen angels of God at a young age and that let me know that God was with me. After high school, Carl joined the army and married. Both his marriage and his military career were short-lived and platoon leader, I mean platoon star and squad leader will come to me and, and they say, oh, you're not doing your job and you should be doing better than this and you're not gonna never make 
uh, the next rank, and so I got really frustrated. Carl decided it was time to get out of the Army by going AWOL. He hitchhiked to Ohio to see an old friend. He then went on a two-week drug binge. One night, Carl went to a crack house in the worst part of Columbus, Ohio. You can smell the stench of the, the crack cocaine. You can smell the stench of the marijuana. People was high and laying all across the, the, the floors. Carl smoked some crack and started drinking alcohol and using other drugs. But he says he believes it was the last pill he took that sent him on a journey to hell. And I took that volume, and before I knew it, I fell off the couch onto the floor. It was pitch black dark. I began to quiver. I began to have the shakes, and I began going down and down and down like a deep uh, pit. And I saw smelling the stench of hell. It's the most rottenest thing that you can ever smell in your life. In fact, you can't even imagine it. I began to feel a tugging, a pulling. Like the Bible says, demons tug and nag at you. They was calling my name. Boy, say, we got you. We got you. We got you. You belong to us now. I saw souls, lost souls that was in torment in the lake of fire. They was crying and calling on God. They was hopeless. And I called on the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And soon I called on his name. I saw the hand of God snatch me out of hell and my spirit went back into my body. Carl says that he was in hell for more than half an hour. I was shaking and trembling and I turned my head to the right. And they said I was dead. And they said that was there was 30 to 35 minutes. But I know that was a loving God that loved me so much. Three days later, Carl returned to Fort Eustis, Virginia to face the consequences of going AWOL. He was demoted and confined to the barracks for one month. During that time alone, he completely surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. I immediately asked the Lord to forgive me, repent, put them sins behind me, go forward, and God, I really gave my life back to Christ after that. Today, Carl is married again. He's also on a mission to tell as many people as he can about the reality of heaven and hell. God loved me so much. He loved me so much that he gives me a second chance. And I'm here to tell the story. Not a story, but the true testimony how awesome God is. And people will only listen and don't take God for granted. Don't throw your life away. Accept Jesus as your Savior. I went my whole life not believing that that hell was real. I said, you know, I didn't want to believe in all that dark stuff, you know. I, there's no hell. That's what I thought. But there is a hell. Jordan Samuel believes there's a hell because he believes he's been there. I could hear cackling, like laughing, <laughs> like laughs they were demons. I could hear stuff. Earlier in his life, he never believed hell existed. If I live my life and do the best I can do, like karma-wise, you know, what goes around comes around, I'll just be the best man that I can be. He grew up in Edmonton, British Columbia with a single mom and went to a Catholic school. He was naturally inquisitive and asked a lot of questions about Jesus. How could one man come and just die for me? And you know, who is this guy? And for that, he was kicked out of class. But my third time getting kicked out of class, I remember saying, you know what? I never want to know this Jesus guy. Whoever he is, he just gets me in trouble and I just get kicked out of class and no one wants to give me answers about him and this is how people treat me. I don't want to know. His mom married and for the next 15 years, Jordan says his family life was great. Then his mom and stepdad divorced. Jordan was devastated. The only way he knew how to deal with the pain was to rebel. So whether that was drinking and driving with buddies and underage driving, stealing cars and, you know, getting stereos and having the thrill of, you know, almost someone catching me, but not quite. 
For the next four years, Jordan continued his reckless behavior, but he wanted to turn his life around, so he stopped selling drugs and started working for an oil rig company. I was making really good money at a really good house. After work one day, Jordan decided to smoke some pot. He didn't know the pipe he used was laced with crack cocaine, something he had never done before. Jordan was sure he was dying. I can feel my heart going boop, 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 slowing down, boop, 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 and then like fluttering. Jordan believes in that moment he went to hell. All these women and all the things you think you want in the world, money, car, success, you know, um, all these things that I had and I was driving, I was just loving it. And then all of a sudden this car broke down. All of a sudden these women turned to huge, huge demons and the, it, it, it earthquaked. And I look behind me and I can hear screaming, it's all red and black. Ah, turn around, turn around, get out of here. It sounded like people burning, people that were just, just burning that couldn't find a cure or a fix to anything. It was just the worst. And I remember being afraid, gripping the steering wheel. And then all of a sudden it was like, I'm back to my body in the trailer room. As Jordan was taking what he thought was his last breath, he made a declaration of faith to God. And my heart's went boom, boom, like the last beat. Not even knowing why, I just said, I believe. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm gone. That's when Jordan says Jesus pulled him out of hell and took him to heaven. He was all in white, he was in a robe when I saw him. And he looked at me and he wears a crown on his head. And his eyes are fierce like fire, but there is no like, like color, just bright looking at me. And he's just, he's like, just, he just is amazing. You're at his feet, you're at the Lord's feet because he's just perfect. You worship him because he's the almighty. You worship him because he's, he's, he saved us. Then Jordan believes he was standing before God. The Lord went to the right hand of the Father, and I began to get judged by the Father. And it was the worst, because what happened was he, he played secrets in my heart that I locked with that I only knew that I ever did. And I thought no one could do, and I could feel what God felt. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Like, it was the worst feeling. And he just comes in, and he hugs you. He says, all is forgiven. My old heart was, was broken. My old heart needed fixing, and God gave me a new heart. All of a sudden, he told me he loved me, that I'm not alone, that I've never been alone. He showed me all the times in my life where I thought I was lucky, that I thought I was alone, but how his hand was always just upon me, and he was always right there pursuing me nonstop. He hugged me again, told me he loved me, and all of a sudden, I was like, Phew back in my trailer room on the floor. I grabbed the Bible. It was like it was glowing and I held it. I opened up the Bible. First thing I ever read out of the Bible was Psalms 34. The happiness of those who trust in God. I began to read it and it was everything that just happened to me. Only God can do that. Jordan shared his journey to heaven and hell with his girlfriend, Danica. His voice changed, his eyes changed, his body language changed. Everything about him was new. It was different. So there was no doubting that he had had the experience that he did. My mouth, my words, swearing, everything was like cleansed, like cleansed. I was delivered from any addiction I had. Today, Jordan and Danica are married with two children. They're missionaries preaching the gospel around the world. They're letting everyone know Jesus is real and that he can change the most hardened heart with his love. God loves the broken and loves the lost, and he doesn't give up on them. He loves them with all his heart. He leaves the flock to find the one, and he did. Hello, everybody out there. Um, this is the title of the day for today. And today, it's over... Um, near-death experiences and uh, Jesus or people crying out from hell 
and Jesus rescuing him from that. Um, you can see those three clips that I played before now. Um, those people, I mean, that's basically what they're saying, you know, that they were living sinful lives and were unbelievers and they, you know, went to hell and Jesus rescued them from that. And um, their stories are very compelling. I mean, at least to me they are. I like seeing those near-death experiences about hell and heaven and everything in between. Um, I used to like to watch that show, I Survived Beyond and Back. And um, uh, it's interesting how some of them, you know, I, I have, like, a lot of faith in, you know. But then some of them, you know, they try to mix in, like, falsehood, you know. Or it's the devil portraying himself as other things. Like, one of the ladies, even on the near-death experiences on I Survived Beyond the Back, said that she saw aliens and stuff. But it was interesting because she had been abducted before. I believe that's what it said, that she was abducted before and then she saw the aliens again. Which is just Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, right? But, um, also at the end of this video, I'm going to show a documentary by, I forget the man's name, but it's called The Secret of the Afterlife Near-Death Experiences. And he goes into more detail about the near-death experience and breaking it down and, and, uh, his thoughts on it but it's a good documentary and i thought it was i wanted to share it on here it's like 35 minutes long it's it's good though if you could watch it it's good um but the main thing is the the ones that i showed right there and even his documentary this is a christian man and his documentary but they don't show any scripture kind of you know to back it up and so that's what i wanted to do here in the middle is to show scripture like i do to to you know show the biblical uh truth on it right Okay, so first let's get started with um, Jesus rescuing someone out of hell, okay? Now this is it's very obvious to a lot of us who read the Bible if we look at Jonah's story. Because Jesus, you know, references uh, himself saying the only sign that these people will get is the sign of Jonah in the well. Alright, so we're going to look at Jonah and how um, I believe Jonah had a near-death experience. That he died and that the Lord... Uh, brought him back a resurrection if you will but like a resurrection in Lazarus type not the resurrection as in Jesus how he resurrected okay because Lazarus was a resurrection right but it was different okay but what would people nowadays would call a near-death experience okay so let's look at that uh, Jonah 1 17 through 3 2 now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights Jonah chapter 2 Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice Okay so it's interesting it says fish okay a lot of people will go like you see like round Saturn's eye and stuff like that he talks about you know being in the belly of the beast or you know the monster and, and that okay uh, uh, but we know that it's a whale okay how do we know that because just like everything else with Jesus he came to fulfill the law he came to fulfill the Torah and the teaching of the Old Testament he tells us it's a whale so it says fish here but Jesus clarifies it and says Jonah was in the belly of the whale so we know it's a whale um, also, if you notice, he says right off the bat, uh, um, uh, he said, I cried by the reason of mine affliction to the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. Okay. Now, other translations will say the grave. Well, either way, he's dead, because how you go to the grave if you don't die? Right? Okay. Um, so that right off the bat tells you that he died. And you can cry out like these see these people near the experiences they cried out to jesus after their death so he could cry out you know but alive or you can cry out in death for thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about all thy billows and thy waves passed over me then i said i'm cast out of thy sight yet i will look again toward thy holy temple Thy holy temple, he's crying out to Jesus, right? Okay, you see that? Thy holy temple, Jesus is. Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I will build it back. And they said, how can you destroy this temple? We, it took 40 years to build it, but they didn't understand he was speaking of the temple of his body, okay? The holy temple, Jesus. Um, also, he says, uh, then I said, I am cast out of your sight. Only, okay, a lot of people like that book, 23 Minutes in Hell, and the man, when he describes going to hell for 23 minutes, he said that the, one of the main things that he felt like was he was completely separated from the Father. 
from his love, from everything. There was no presence of God there. Okay, that's one of the worst things about hell. And so that's what Jonah is feeling here. I'm cast out of your sight, right? The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. So he's dead. He's dead. He's drowning. Seaweed is wrapped around his head. You see that? Like, he's gone all the way down to the, to the depths of the water. He's drowning, okay? Before the whale even swallows him. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Okay, and I tried to find this, um... I tried to find this uh, verse about, um, I mean, not this verse, I'm sorry. The verse that I was speaking of is uh, Peter and Jude, where they said that the angels are trapped in chains of eternal darkness. They're in a prison of eternal darkness, right? The sp that Jesus went down to the, sp the spirits in prison. Okay, and that here, that's what Jonah's talking about. The, uh, the earth with her bars was about me forever, okay? Hellfire is eternal, right? Um so, and also there was a, a near-death experience where this man was talking about how he was, I couldn't find it, but I remember seeing it a long time ago, where he was trapped in a prison cell in hell. And like he was go, looking over this huge abyss, looking down, and he could just, all he, all he could feel was depression and, and just anguish and all this stuff. And it was, he was like the emotional feeling was destroying him. And he was trapped there and he could see all these other cells like just looking down to this abyss and heat was all coming up and it was blackness and everything. And he said that finally, he didn't know if he was there for 40 minutes or for 4,000 years. He said because time didn't exist there. And if you look, a lot of these near-death experiences, that's what they'll say is first of all, they realize if they go to a heavenly one that they're home the second thing is that time doesn't exist there right so um he said that he finally he eventually he cried out to jesus he cried out to jesus and this huge white light hand came in all the way through the bars grabbed him and picked him up and put him back on the earth and it was like a misty it was like the earth but different and it was all misty looking and he spoke with jesus and jesus said you keep living your life that's where you're going to be for an eternity. Is that what you want? And he said, no. He goes, okay, but well, I'm going to send you back. But I have things I'll need you to do and to, you know, to take care of and everything and be a good man, right? And so he did, and he's a preacher now. But I couldn't find his testimony, but it's really good. But that's what the Jonah is speaking about here, being in prison, in bars, in hell. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord, my God. Okay, and corruption here reminds me of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's like 51 through 54 or something, where it's talking about um, this incorruption will put on, uh, this corruption will put on incorruption, which means uh, uh, immortality, incorruption means immortality, also it means indestructible, which is pretty awesome, right, indestructible force, that's why we'll be able to destroy all the armies of, of the Antichrist and Satan when we come back with Jesus for the second coming because we'll have indestructible bodies, right? We won't be, they won't be able to take us out, which is awesome. Um, but the corruption means decay, you know, means, you know, withering away. And a lot of these people talk about how 23 minutes in hell, he talks about how the demons would rip him apart in hell and then he would go all back together. So he would decay and come apart, but then he'd go back together just so they could be tortured again. All right, so that's what he's saying. You brought me up my life from corruption, from the decay. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. So, the same thing these people talk about. They go down there to, to, to hell, to the abyss, and they start crying out to Jesus. They remember the Lord. They go, oh, Jesus is the only thing that can help me, right? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Mm -hmm. Salvation is of the Lord. That reminds me of, you know, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. They're all thankful once Jesus saves them. And they make a vow to him that they live better lives, right? They give themselves over to the Lord, which is awesome. Salvation is of the Lord. Yeshua, right? Um, okay. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Okay, so he's dead still, but he spit out on the dry land. Now this is where I believe the resurrection happens. Jonah, chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, 
Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Okay, so you see that? Did you catch it? Okay, so first of all, the word of the Lord. Jesus, right? He spoke. Like, he spoke to um, Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus come out, like four words, right? Okay, so he, he spoke to Lazarus and he came out. He said, Arise, Lazarus. Come out, right? Here, what does he say to Jonah? Arise. He's resurrecting him there. You see that? Okay. And so Jonah arose and went uh, to Nivea uh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nivea was an exceedingly great city of three days journey. So three again, three days, all of it, you know, connects together. Now, what's also interesting is the whole thing that Jonah went through would be a testimony to the people of Nivea because they worship Dagon, which D-A-G-O-N, like I made about Cthulhu and Dagon, that, that's like the father of Baal. He was a fish god, half fish, half man. So Jonah going into the sea, the fish swallowing him, the whale swallowing him, spitting him out, him being resurrected, all of this would have been a sign to build the men of Nivea's faith. And that's why they followed, you know, the words that he said and they repented and changed their ways, okay? They repented and changed because he had all this. You see what I'm saying? So, so the fish story would have related to them because they were already worshiping a fish god. You see what I mean? And also, just for, you know, um, if you care to know, uh, the the hats that the Pope wear, the fish, it looks like a fish. That's Dagon, okay? They're half man, half fish. And then the Popes, you know, like I made in my other video, they think that they're God, like a pharaoh. They think that they're God man, okay? Okay, so anyway, but that's another story. But, um... But you see that, okay, so he's resurrected, he goes to them, ministers to them, and it, it makes them repent and turn to the Lord, okay? Alright, so also, um, if we look at Matthew 12, 38 through 31, Jesus tells us this, you know, that all these things have to come to pass, and the same type of near-death experience, resurrection, the resurrection that happened to Jonah will happen to Jesus, but even a more miraculous and just awesome one. So let's listen to that, Matthew 12. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given. And to hear, I mean, he's fixing to speak in Nineveh after this, but I think he's speaking in Nineveh here. He's seeing an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. Or need a sign for them to be to have faith, right? And Nivea was wicked and adulterous. We know that, okay? Uh, and so they needed that sign. And Jesus is saying, as they, being wicked and evil, needed the sign, and now you are the same wicked and adulterous, and you need the sign, right? To it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Well, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, see, so he's saying the same thing, okay? The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Because why? He knew that the scribes and the Pharisees would not believe and would not repent. So he's saying, you you are an evil and adulterous generation. Nivea and the men and women there, and the, not the children, but the men and the women there were wicked and adulterous. But they listened to Jonah and repented because of the resurrection and everything else that he went through. And they turned to the Father. But you are so wicked and adulterous Pharisees and scribes that you won't. Right? So he said these men would rise up and want to destroy you if they could because you won't repent. Right? And you can see that... It's interesting, I made a video about this a long time ago, but if you go and read Jonah, and then go read Sodom and Gomorrah, and compare them to each other, you see what God will spare and what God want, will not spare. Because if you read in the end of Jonah, Jonah is still upset because he didn't want to help the people, and, and he sits under a tree moping, and um, um, God says to Jonah, why should I have destroyed all of these thousands of people and especially this, I think he says 10,000 uh, 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 10, of that don't know their right from their left hand. 
who doesn't know the right from the left hand? A child. So he's saying the children, you want me to destroy the children? You know, you're worried about a tree, Jonah, but you want me to destroy the children of this city? You know, where, where's your head at here? You know, um, but if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, even the children were corrupted because it says from the least to the oldest wanted to have sex with the angels and stuff. So everything was corrupted in Sodom and Gomorrah, like from the child all the way up to the oldest man and woman. Okay, so see... Okay, anyway, all flesh was corrupted in other words. Same thing with the um, the flood. Even animals were corrupted in the flood. All flesh was corrupted. Sodom and Gomorrah, all flesh was corrupted. But Nivea, all flesh wasn't corrupted. Okay. Um, now, you see that uh, if we look at Ephesians 4, um, 8 through 10. Let me get over there first. It shows how, you know, these type of things go on. They happened when Jesus uh, resurrected for the first time. Before he resurrected for the first time, he went and led captivity captive. He went to Abraham's bosom. He went to uh, Tartarus and preached to the fallen angels down there, proclaimed victory over them. And then he came to Sh uh, Hades and took the keys of death in Hades, right? And preached to all of them in Hades. And whoever repented and believed in him, he brought up with him. And whoever was in Abraham's bosom, the good side, he preached to them. And whoever believed, they came back up with him. Okay, out of Sheol, uh, the abode of the dead, right? Okay, so he brought them back up. And it's even if you read in the end of Matthew, it says that after his resurrection, many dead saints came back to life then and walked around the city of Jerusalem like a first fruit, right? Okay. So let's listen to that in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. See, he gave gifts unto them, even though they were dead and in this uh, dead place, right? Even some of them were in a bad place and some of them were in a good place, but they were dead and he gave gifts to the men that were dead. He's still doing that today, as we can see through these near-death experiences. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Amen. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. All things. Okay, you see that? Um, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, the Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost are doing miracles all over the world. It's just we don't see it or accept it nowadays. Okay, we just don't. We don't see that, uh, like... Muslims in countries where missionaries can't get, they can't have a Bible, they don't even know Jesus except for what the Quran says. Jesus comes to them spiritually, showing himself to them and says, I am Jesus, you know, believe in me, I am the way and the truth and the life. Same thing with Paul. He came up, Paul was so reprobate and so thought he was doing godly work. And he, what happened? Jesus came in front of him spiritually boom he saw him and he said I'm I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting so you think that would only happen then it wouldn't happen now no it, it, it goes on all through time that Jesus has been doing that the Old Testament Saints saw him Daniel saw him in his um, uh, transfiguration form right okay so it it, um, it keeps going on and he I mean God loves everyone so much that even if they are in a state of death in hell, he still wants to help them and save them, okay? And I believe that's always going to go on until maybe after Judgment Day, and then that's the end of it, right? Because it says at the lake of fire that hell and death will be thrown into the lake of fire with the beast and everything else and Satan. And then the lake of fire outer darkness is the in second death if you will okay so why before before judgment comes you have every opportunity i mean people die and they still have an opportunity right we see that with these near-death experiences because that's how loving god is we have a loving father not a punishing evil mean father okay all right um now let's also look at luke eleven twenty nine through 30 which says and when the people were gathered uh, thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah uh, was a sign unto the uh, Nevites, that's what I was saying, as Jonah's death 
resurrection and being swallowed by the whale so that they can, you know, understand. He can talk about the whale and they can go, oh, like Dagon. And he can go, no, Dagon can't do this, can't do what the Father can do, resurrect me and all this other stuff. You see, so he was, he, Jonah was assigned to them. So, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation, right? His resurrection, um, him, you know, saving us from our sins, hallelujah. Uh, Luke uh, 22 through 24 says, Saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be uh, risen risen the third day. Um, and... And you notice the, th the three days in Jonah's story. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now that to me speaks to Jonah too, because Jonah wouldn't deny himself. He would keep, he wanted to do what he wanted to do to this point to where he was running away from his home to, to get on a boat to get away from what the father wanted him to do, right? He wasn't denying himself. He was wanting to do what he wanted to do, right? Okay, but Jesus didn't do that. He denied himself because he was sinless, but yet he took on sin. So himself was sinless, but he took on something that wasn't himself, you see? Um, and, it, and he took up his, and took up your cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake will uh, the same shall save it. And it's interesting if you compare that to Jonah, because he said Jonah's trying to save his own life by taking off and getting on the boat, but he loses it. He loses his life because of that, not listening to the Father. Okay. Um, also, John, uh, John thirteen. 15 through 17 says, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent uh, greater than he that sent him. Um, if ye know these things, happy are you if, if, ye, <laughs> if ye do them, right? So, if you're going to die, you know you're going to die, and especially if you're martyred for Christ, he is our example of that. And why? Because we're going to be resurrected, right? He says that we'll be quickened, we'll be brought back to life, you know, by the Spirit, by the Father, by Him, we'll come back. So, we follow after what He did, and you know the servant isn't greater than the master and we know that that might come but we should rejoice in it and be happy in it because we'll be resurrected either way hallelujah <laughs> um okay now let's look at the perfect example of a near-death experience in the new testament okay and we can see that with paul and paul is going to explain this to us in first corinthians 11 uh 21 through 12 10 which says this I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. How be it wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Okay, so he's, you know, he knows through his labors in Christ, I am more, as what he just said. He knows that he's going to have to die, he's going to have to suffer, he's going to be persecuted, right? But it's all okay because he understands this. Um, and isn't it interesting here that what does he say? <laughs> you know, he says, um, in deaths often so we are going to see one sense of a near-death experience that paul has but he's saying he's had many near-death experiences i know that i know that he was stoned for sure right that they stoned him one time and then um he was dead um but then there's other if you read outside of the bible and the other uh, you know non-biblical texts um it talks about you know in in church you know tradition it talks about in the early church tradition talks about he died a few times right and he's saying here in in deaths often <laughs> i'm sure maybe he drowned with the ship you know and then the lord brought him back we know that he got stung by a poisonous viper and it didn't kill him right because the lord had something for him to do like jonah if the lord's got something for you to do he ain't gonna let you die he's gonna bring you back and you're gonna go keep going right <laughs> all right 
Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save mm. one. Man. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Stone. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In the deep. To me, that went back to Jonah. He's Jonah was in the deep, right? Like, and Paul's here talking about the deep. Right? Isn't that interesting? Okay. And the belly of the beast, the whale, if you will. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Mm. What does that remind you of, what Jesus said? They'll kill you thinking they're doing God a service, right? We're dealing with that today, too, with Islam and with Christians, trying to, false Christians trying to, you know, have this... One world religion, and you know, Rick Warren and Joel Osteen and all this. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not. Amen. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Amen. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Right, so he's saying sometimes, you know, I died and the Lord rescued me from that. Sometimes he just gave me the um, the knowledge through the Holy Ghost to escape out of there, right? Or the, the viper bit him and it didn't do nothing to him and everybody was amazed. They thought that Paul was a god, the native people, because he got bit by the viper and he didn't die. And they've seen all these other people die, so they assumed that he was a god. But then he preached the gospel to them, okay? So let's go on now. He's going to explain in 12 the near-death experience and um, how he's made strong by Christ. Okay, even though... And it's interesting when he says he uh, that he's not weak and he's not offended, but if he glories in anything, he's going to glory in his affirmities, his, his the bad things, you know, the persecution that he went through. He's going, he's going to glory in that, and he's going to glory in his sins. He's going to, like, he's going to... He's not going to boast about himself... He's going to boast about his infirmities in the way and in his iniquities to give people hope through his testimony. You see, um, and it, it, that's better to do that, right? Because you don't want to speak highly of yourself. And it's interesting right here. He he makes it seem like he ain't speaking about himself, but he is because he has to speak about himself in some ways uh, boldly so that they get the point. Okay, <laughs> so here we go with that. Second Corinthians twelve. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. So, and in out of the body experience is what he's talking about a near death experience is what he's talking about that he went through okay that actually he went up to the third heaven to where god's throne is like that okay how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter of such an one will i glory yet of myself i will not glory but in mine infirmities for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Okay, so it's spe he's speaking about himself here. And he's even talking about, like, I don't know, maybe the third heaven isn't where God's throne is, but maybe it's where the Garden of Eden is, because I have a belief now, and I'll just make that in another video in a few days about different dimensions, and that the Garden of Eden, paradise, God's paradise, the Garden of Eden, is in another dimension, you know, I kind of saw this thing by Chuck Misler and another guy, and they were kind of 
talking uh, one both of them were talking about kind of the same thing and then i put my kind of re-research on it and it seems that way that that's why no one can find the garden of eden god's paradise is because it's actually in another spiritual realm uh dimension that's why the cherubim was put on the east of it with the flaming sword that spins all around so they can't get through the portal or gateway you know to it okay anyway but that's another video i'm sorry <laughs> trying to stay focused but um you see, so he's speaking of himself here, and he's talking about how he had a near-death experience. And we don't know if it was the stoning or what time it was, but that's what he had. I mean, that's exactly what it says. And he even heard things that were um, unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. It almost sounds like Enoch, if you've ever read the book of Enoch. It sounds like maybe he had some kind of experience, an Enoch-type experience, right? Okay, but... This he goes and talks about the revelations, even this revelation, but that's all not as um, as worthy or as uplifting and edifying as what he's fixing to talk about, and that is uh, Jesus, right? Okay, so here we go. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Right, so no one knows really what the thorn in the flesh is. Could have been like his sick sickness. I mean, he could have, you know, had this near-death experience here and been so physically hurt, blind or something. We do know that he couldn't see good up until right before he got martyred because Timothy and... Uh, Luke had to help him write his letters, his epistles. So it could have been that. That could have been a thorn in his flesh, or it could have been something else. Uh, no one really knows. But um, um, you see, but he, he, he was through just the revelation of him being resurrected, right? Near death experience brought back. Um, he could have been just filled with, you know, boasting because of that. But no, he he knows that um, he is. That, that he is weak and Christ is strong, right? Okay. Because why? Christ pulled him out, out of the, the, the grips of death, right? Jesus pulled him out of that and brought him back, obviously. Just like Lazarus and... Okay. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities... In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And he can take, he can say this stuff. He can take pleasure in the affirmities and reproach and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. Why? Because he knows if he's still got things to do and it's the Lord's will, Jesus will just bring him back. You know, just like the little girl who died, Jesus said, why are you weeping? She's only sleeping. Watch, I'm going to bring her back. You know, like, if, if if the Lord has something for you to do, he'll bring you back, you know? So he ain't scared of any of this stuff because he knows that the Lord is going to bring him back. And if the Lord doesn't bring him back, he says in other uh, epistles, good to be uh, to be here with you is good for me to be here with you is good for you. Me to be out of the body is better because I'm with Christ right okay so death it he knew that dying crossing over was better for him <laughs> because he was with jesus okay so to end it paul can say this stuff because he lived it he went through it just like these people went through their near-death experiences and uh paul died he went to heaven that's why he can boldly tell us and we can believe this in um for second corinthians 5 8 9 he went through this he can boldly say this to us and we can believe him and have faith in him that his words are true and inspiration from the holy ghost because this i mean this is what he says because he knows this he went through it. we are confident i say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the lord wherefore we labor that whether absent whether present or absent we may be accepted uh, accepted of him so he's saying um, uh, if we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. Okay, He knows that. Just like these people who went to hell know that. If they're outside of the body, 
the Lord is present there with them. Even if they're in hell, he'll come and help them. If they're in heaven, of course, right? <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? As soon as you leave the body, you step outside of time. You step into the other spiritual realm. And, you know, the Lord and everything is there. You don't, like, time is still going on here leading up to Judgment Day and the Second Coming and everything else. And the end of time on this earth. But when you die, you're outside of time. Okay, and and all that other stuff is either already happening or gone, or maybe in the future you're you're like God. You can see everything like a helicopter sees a parade, right? You ever heard that? So you see that? That's why Paul boldly can say, if you're outside of the body with the Lord, because he went through it. He had a near death experience and a resurrection. Okay, all right. Well, the next video is gonna play, and I hope y'all enjoy it because I I think he does a really good documentary about it. Uh, Wake and watch for Yeshua. God is love, and I love God. Amen. Hey, what happens after someone dies? Do you think there's a heaven? Sure, we're gonna go to heaven. Yes, sir. No. I think that that was something, like, heaven and hell was kind of made up. Are you afraid of dying? No, I'm not afraid of death. Where are you going when you die? At the moment, hell. Stephen, what do you think happens when someone dies? Do you think there's an afterlife? Uh, I don't know, probably not. Probably not? So this is all there is? Uh, I think so, yeah. Do you believe God exists? I don't think so, no. If there is a heaven, do you think you get there? Are you a good person? Oh, yeah. For sure. God wouldn't be mad at me. I'm a good person morally. Yeah, I'm a good person. I'd hope so. Yes, sir. I believe in God. I believe in good. I don't do nobody no harm. If there's a heaven, do you think you're good enough to go there? Are you a good person? Uh, yeah, I think I'm a good person. Why would you go to hell? Because of my lifestyle I'm living. There is no hell. I don't believe that there is a judgment. You don't? My name is Tommy Warren. I'm an independent researcher and U.S. citizen. What I'm about to discuss with you is something that you probably know nothing about, and that's about this phenomenon called near-death experiences. What a near-death experience is, is when someone either dies or comes close to dying, they have an out-of-body experience during their death, and when they're resuscitated, they tell about what they experienced on the other side. Now, if you're like me, the first thing I thought of when I had heard someone had died and they experienced something that they thought was real was that this was really just a lack of oxygen to their brain and that they were hallucinating the whole thing. However, after just watching a few of these near-death experience testimonies, it becomes clear that there's way more to it than just that, because these stories are actually related to each other. And what you'll find if you watch a ton of these testimonies is that they actually tell the exact same story. So before we take our journey into the afterlife, I want to take a moment to address some important things with you first. Our society today, especially our younger generation, has been socially programmed or socially conditioned, if you will, to always be asking ourselves, how does this make me feel? What I mean by this is when we see, hear, or read something, we're always asking ourselves, does this make me feel good? And if it doesn't make us feel good, 
then we automatically reject it and move on. However, the reason why this is a flawed way of looking at things is because when it comes to something that's important, what ultimately matters is, what is the truth? For instance, let's take a hypothetical scenario. Let's say, just as a hypothetical, that God is real. Let's say that God created the world, He gave us rules to live by, and that we're going to be judged according to those rules in the afterlife based on how we lived while we're living. So if this scenario were true, we can do what makes us feel good. But if it's not in accordance with the rules, then we're still going to be judged according to those rules. So as you can see, when it comes to something that's important, sometimes it doesn't matter what makes us feel good. What really matters is what the truth actually is, whether we like it or not. And so I've heard people say before, well, I decide where I'm going to go. I control where I'm going to go when I die. I'm going to heaven or wherever. But here's the flaw with that one. If you do have a soul, can you control where your soul goes right now? Can you make it leave your body right now? You see, the problem is, if you can't control where your soul goes right now, what makes you think you can control where it goes in the afterlife? And so you don't hear people talk about this next point, probably because no one has a good answer or they haven't ever thought about it. But let's just look at the facts. No one knows for sure what's going to happen in the afterlife until we get there. We can have faith, belief, and conviction about it, but we don't know for sure what's going to happen. And here's proof of that. Between the major different religions and the different denominations of each of those religions, there are literally over 10,000 different religions that all say theirs is the only true religion. Well, there's a real problem in the world then, isn't there? Because there are 6.9 billion people in the world today, and even if the biggest religion is correct, the biggest one, which would be the Roman Catholic Church, then that would mean 83% of the world is wrong. 83%! And that's just the biggest one. If you look at most groups of religions, that number increases exponentially. With most religions out there, if they were the true one, that would mean the other 99% of the world is wrong. So here's the problem we're left with. People have conviction. They have belief about what's going to happen in the afterlife. Many people are willing to die for it, or even sometimes kill for their religion. But the fact of the matter is, everybody thinks they're right. But with most of the religions out there, there's over a 99% chance that they're wrong. It has to be that way. Do the math. There's no other way. So my point in telling you this is just to make you aware that there's a very real confusion in the world today. And by definition, no matter how they feel about it, most of the world has to be wrong. So getting back on topic with these near-death experiences, which I'm very excited to tell you about, I wanted to make this movie to share my knowledge about these and to put that knowledge out there because number one, the majority of the population doesn't even know about near-death experiences. And number two, I've watched so many of them that I certainly feel qualified enough to make a short educational film about the topic. So I'm gonna share with you about these experiences, but you'll have to take my word for it you can check these out for yourself. You can Google them. You can go onto YouTube and search about them. 
and watch these yourself to see for yourself that what I'm telling you is exactly what's out there. In fact, I kind of like it when people try to prove me wrong on this because what you'll find is exactly what I'm talking about and you'll end up with the truth. So I had stumbled across this phenomenon of these NDEs and I had only watched a few of these testimonies at the time and I thought they were remarkable because they were related to each other and I could see that right away. And one night I was telling my wife about them her name is Tara by the way and she told me that she already knew about these. Well, it took me a couple more days of listening to her tell me she already knew about them before I asked her what she meant. And what she proceeded to tell me stunned me. So when Tara was five years old, she was living with her mother. Her mother was bipolar and very abusive. And on many occasions, she tried to kill Tara. I mean, her mom was crazy. And on one of these occasions, when she was trying to do just that, now, I can't give you the exact details because I gave Tara my word I wouldn't go into the very specifics of it, but her mother was trying to kill her and had left her for dead in the kitchen. Now, when she was left for dead, she had herself a near-death experience. And so here's what she remembers. She left her body. She was looking at herself and could see herself in the situation she was in, about to die. She went through the wall into the other room and could see her mother laughing about it. I mean, this is how crazy her mother was. And she also saw her brother freaking out as well in another room. Now, here's the key. She was then met by Jesus and three angels. So the angels told her they were there to calm her down, which they did. And what Jesus told her was that she was a child of God. Tara also asked if she would have to stay with her mother much longer. And Jesus told her no, which was the truth, because shortly after that, her father gained custody of her. So after this experience, she woke up in the hospital. And that was the end of her experience which she later told to her family counselor who documented everything. Now, here's the important part of this. At that time, Tara was just five years old. She had no real concept of who Jesus was. However, like it says in God's word, the Bible, when you see him, you know him. And so I personally watched about 50 different individual testimonies of these near-death experiences. And what I've discovered is that they tell the exact same story. Now, keep in mind that these are people from all walks of life, all different parts of the world, all different religions, even atheists. And also, these are people who don't know each other. So I'm going to describe to you now what that same story is. And I'm going to encourage you to use this description when you watch these and to try to prove me wrong on this. So here's the same story that each of these tell. <laughs> Three different types of near-death experiences. There are those that see a biblical heaven, those that see a biblical hell, and those that don't get to go far enough to the other side to see either of those two places. 
in every case, the person leaves their body and they are themselves but in a spiritual body, their soul, outside of their body. When they're in this state, they have all their five senses and their senses are heightened. In other words, it feels even more real than when we're living right now. Which is why the people who have had these experiences will testify that what they went through was definitely real and not a dream. Now, what happens is you have an out-of-body experience, which is your soul, and the first step that you might experience is lingering for a little bit in the area that you died in. Seeing yourself dead, being able to pass through walls, seeing and hearing the people around you when you die, but then not being able to see or hear you. If you get to go to the next point, then you'll experience what is a gateway. And there's basically two different types of these gateways. One goes to heaven, and the other goes to hell. Now, a lot of times these gateways look different to different people, but that's what they're in when they don't know where they are. So, with the Heaven Gateway, many times it looks like a tunnel with a light at the end of it, and that light that they see is the light of God. With the Hell Gateway, a lot of times you're surrounded by pitch black darkness, and sometimes it feels like you're falling with that darkness around you. And then from there, if you get to go to the next point, you'll experience a Biblical version of Heaven or a Biblical version of Hell. So let's recap. There are three different types of near-death experiences and three different steps you can go through during the near-death experience. The three different types of NDEs are Heaven, Hell, and not going far enough to the other side to see Heaven or Hell. The three different steps of the NDE you can go through are 1. Lingering around your dead body Number two, what is a gateway? And number three, the end point of heaven or hell. Now, an important point to keep in mind while watching these is that while not everyone is confused by their experience, some are. And there are two parts that seem to confuse people the most.